In my previous video, I talk about when two populations interact and evolve reciprocally. Sometimes, the evolution doesn't happen reciprocally. What could happen is one of the organisms mimic the other, or at least that's what it looks like. It's called mimicry. And so, let me broad up the question. What exactly is mimicry? <coughs> to put it very simply, mimicry can be described as an occurrence where an organism evolves in a way where it mimics another organism. Quite simple, right? But the question is, how do you know that? What if it's just a coincidence? So, there are generally three sites for the occurrence of mimicry. The mimic, the model, and the receiver. For an occurrence to be called a mimicry, the mimic has to mimic the model. Well, of course, that's obvious, isn't it? The second, the receiver's behavior has to be affected by the mimicking in a way so that the mimic receives a benefit. The third, which might be difficult to determine, is that the receiver has to perceive the mimic and the model as something similar. If there are no observable receivers, then it will not be considered mimicry. If there are no interaction at all, of course it's also not considered mimicry. For example, the convergent evolution between Molochoridus and Prinosoma. They are not related at all, and they don't even live in the same area, so it cannot be a case of mimicry. Oh, by the way, the mimic doesn't necessarily have to mimic the entire things from the model. It can just be a specific trait, like just the color or the sound, or even things like their feces or trails. And the mimic doesn't have to be the entire populations. It can just be the specific genders, the juveniles, the one in specific area, etc. Mimicry can be done in several ways. For example, chemical mimicry, where an orchid mimics the sex pheromone of a female wasp to attract the male wasp that pollinates it. Visual mimicry, where a harmless fish mimics the looks of a venomous fish to avoid predation. Acoustic mimicry, where a bird mimics the vocalization of other bird species to attract females. Seismic mimicry, where a predator beetle mimics the vibration of a struggling aphid in a spider web to attract the spider. Or it could also be multimodal, where a brute parasite mimics both the call and the looks of the host nestlings. So it's both acoustic and visual. Mimicry can be defensive or aggressive. Defensive mimicry shows fitness cost to the receiver. Think of it like punishment. And so, it affects them negatively, such as repelling them while the aggressive mimicry shows fitness benefit to the receiver. Think of it like a reward. And so, it affects the receiver positively, such as attracting them. Traditionally, defensive mimicry is divided into three types, at least for animals. Those three are Batesian, Mullerian, and Amslian, or Mertensian. Batesian and Mullerian mimicry are quite simple, while Amslian is, let's just say, debatable. Batesian mimicry happens typically when a non-dangerous organism mimics a dangerous one. More technically, when it shows fitness cost to the receiver and the signal is deceptive. For example, the non-venomous snake Atractus latifrons mimicking the highly venomous Micrurus albicinctus. That way, predators avoid Atractus latifrons. Mullerian mimicry typically happens when relatively dangerous organisms mimic each other. More technically, when it shows fitness cost to the receiver and the signal is non-deceptive. For example, the viceroy and monarch butterfly, which are two poisonous butterflies with similar color and pattern. Predators as the receiver will learn that this color and pattern means danger, and so they avoid those butterflies. Sometimes, animals can form a mimicry complex. Inside the complex, both Batesian and Mullerian mimicry can happen at the same time. For example, the mimicry complex in Amazonian leaf litter frogs. Frog number 1 and 2 are non-toxic, while the rest are toxic. And so, frog number 1 and 2 mimics the other frogs. That's the Batesian mimicry. Frog number 3 to 6 mimic each other. That's the Mullerian mimicry. And so, let's talk about Amslian mimicry. In concept, it's not that complicated, but I need to explain this step by step. So, there is a mimicry complex of coral snakes and milk snakes. They have similar coloration and patterns as always. The milk snakes are harmless, while the coral snakes are highly venomous. So, as the example in frogs before, you can logically make sense that milk snakes do Batesian mimicry to the coral snakes, while the coral snakes do Mullerian mimicry to each other. 
And there is another participant in this complex, the false coral snake. The false coral snakes are not that dangerous, but still venomous. So, by this logic, the false coral snakes also do Batesian mimicry to the coral snakes, but Emsley suggests otherwise. The logic is like this. If the predator dies, it cannot learn anything. So, predators that targeted the coral snakes will die, and nothing in particular happen. But, if predators target the false coral snakes, they will be harmed indeed, but they can still survive. Just to clarify, by they, I mean the predators. So, they will learn to avoid the false coral snake. And so, Emsley suggested, by this logic, the model must be the false coral snake. The more dangerous coral snake must mimic the false coral snakes, because what the predator actually learns to avoid is the false coral snake not the true coral snake. Recent publications usually disregard Amsley and mimicry, so don't worry about it too much. Next is the aggressive mimicry. In aggressive mimicry, the mimic shows a fitness benefit to the receiver, and the signal is deceptive. For example, in the case of an orchid mantis resembling an orchid to attract prey, the signal is the flower's form, pattern, and coloration, which is where the prey normally gets nectars from. And so, they approached the mantis and then got eaten. Another form of mimicry with a fitness benefit signal is the so-called rewarding mimicry. In this type, the signal is non-deceptive. For example, the case of indigo birds or fidua. Fidua is a brood parasite, meaning they lay their egg in other birds' nests. Male vidua will mimic the vocalization of its brood parents. Female fidua prefers the male that vocalize similarly to their brood parents. This way, fidua can reinforce the behavior of choosing the host from a certain species. And so, the types of mimicry can be generalized into these four, based on the consequence to the receiver and the deceptiveness of the signal. When you read all their publications, you can see many other types of mimicry. For example, the Wasmanian mimicry between ant colony dwellers. Some types are plant-specific too, but in general, all these other types can be classified into these four, so don't worry about it. The mimics can mimic by signal or by cue. Signal means deliberate source of information, while cue means incidental source of information. So, for example, in the Amazonian frogs from before, this is a signal. It's called aposematic coloration which is a specific signal intended to show predators that they are dangerous. In the case of bird poop caterpillar, they mimic the poop of birds, so predators don't eat them. This is a cue, because it's not like bird poop are specifically made to deter a predator. It's just that predators don't like eating poop. And so, what the caterpillar mimicking is a cue, not a signal. Alright, let's talk about auto-mimicry. Auto-mimicry is the case where the mimic mimics itself. In other words, the model is itself, or at least its own species. For example, some fish has an eye pattern on their back, and some butterflies has a false head on their back. Same logic, both misdirecting predators to attack their back, reducing lethal attack, possibly even confusing them so much that they don't even try. In some cases, which is also known as the Browerian mimicry, some states or genders of animals are more dangerous than the others. And so, sometimes they mimic those dangerous stages or gender. It's basically a Batesian mimicry, but the model is still from the same species. So, do auto mimicry count as a true mimicry? Debatable for sure, but I want to talk about it anyway. Next, let's talk about masquerade. So, all these times, I've been talking about other organisms as the model or at least things that are still connected to organisms. But what if the model is not connected to organisms at all, like a rock, for example? That's called masquerade, and it does happen. For example, the lizard Tympanocryptis cephalus. In a way, this is a special case of mimicry, at least according to this publication. There is also a thing called imperfect mimicry. That's when the mimic signal or cue is, well, imperfect. It doesn't really look that similar, at least to the eye of humans. In fact, many cases of mimicry are imperfect, depends on how much you want to nitpick. 
There is even a publication formulating methods to determine the mimetic accuracy. But the thing is, in the context of mimicry as a natural occurrence, similarity in our perception doesn't really matter. Because what matters is the perception of the intended receiver. In concept, mimicry is simple. In practice, not really. There are many considerations to be made. Many postulates and theories. For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for Wait. Huh? What's the thing on the bottom left corner of the thumbnail? What are you talking about? Nothing there. What? There's nothing there. Wait, wh what? Am I hallucinating? Maybe you're just tired. Oh, hello. Um, who are you? Goodbye. Goodbye.